Um, the next speaker is Manuel Jiménez Garcia, who's um, joining us from London, from the Bartlett School of Architecture. He's a co-founder of the Design Computation Lab at the Bartlett, where he's also me and Molly, our distinguished uh, colleague. And um, he also runs his own practice, Madam Design, and a 3D printing company, Nagami. Cool. And then we have, after this, we have the round table. Perfect. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you for the for the introduction, Jill, and uh, Martin for the the invitation. It's a pleasure to be, uh, pleasure to be back in Prague uh, two years after. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, as Jill described, um, I I wear multiple hats. Uh, these are my three main ones. So I run my my own uh, um, design practice, uh, modern design. And then I'm, I'm also one of the co-founders of the lab that has been mentioned now already uh, quite a few times today. And uh, um, a design and manufacturing, uh, robotic manufacturing company based in Spain. So um, those three fields uh, cross over uh, the multiple locations. And, and we also share uh, interest in the work with just um, particular focus. Um, so yeah, just to summarize, this uh, has been as well framed by uh, Molly and Jill. Uh, we we pretty much try to uh, rethink the notion of the of the digital in architecture. So um, this is a, a summary of the transition from uh, modernism uh, to the uh, so-called uh, digital, uh, which is syntactically the same. So it's basically a smoothing a smoothing operation. Um, the, the digital architecture, or how we've been calling it until today, um, is being um, uh, first kind of framed by uh, Greg Lin, and it's connected to this notion of continuity. Um, so it's a, it's a continuous form that gets continuously differentiated um, by just uh, pulling points in and out, right? So um, it's a criticism of the modernist uh, assembly um, towards something that is more uh, constantly viable. And uh, so this is, a, um, you all know this project, right? So um, Greg claims uh, a form that is in continuous evolution and uh, can be a stop at any moment and uh, uh, construct uh, different architectures, right? Um, and uh, so that, uh, that leads to this uh, notion of continuity that the uh, uh, architects such as uh, Knox, who is not doing architecture anymore, um, kind of materialize. Um, um, however, uh, as we all know, to, to actually uh, materialize and build architecture, um, the notion of the, of the parts uh, comes alive again, right? Uh, so you can't build architecture without parts. So the, the dream of continuity of the early 2000s has been materialized very recently uh, following uh, very um, distinct uh, techniques. Yeah? So you can build most of the digital buildings uh, today uh, by paneling, waffling, or slicing. Yeah? Um, and this technique could, uh, could be complexified as much as you want and optimize to, to avoid uh, this uh, huge, complicated puzzle of thousands of panels uh, coming together uh, with workers trying to differentiate one, one from another. Uh, so in this case, for example, this is one of the most um, evolved um, or advanced uh, paneling a algorithm uh, using machine learning to just make the panels uh, a bit more classified. Um, on the other hand, um, people like uh, Neil Gersenfeld in Set for, uh, for Bits and Atoms in, in MIT, and this has been mentioned before as well, uh, is describing a form that is evolving by addition, right? So 
um, by just uh, creating a unit that is instantiated and uh, connected differently, we can create uh, different formations with also different behavior. Uh, in this case, this is a collaboration with, with NASA, uh, where the flexibility of the, of the element varies locally uh, according to the aggregation method uh, used in that particular case. Um, well, this is also something, is that working? Yes. Um, this is a, another example by uh, Disney Research, uh, where they are trying to 3D print uh, toys uh, without uh, mechanic articulations. So out of just one single uh, material. Uh, but of course, uh, you want these objects to, um, to have a differentiated degree of flexibility along the object. So you can still uh, play with it and articulate it, right? And uh, this is thanks to um, a voxelization method, uh, which substitutes these groups of voxels uh, with uh, materials of different densities, right? So geometry is dictating uh, the actual flexibility of the, of the object. Um, so that's something that we've been um, uh, working with for quite a few years now, four or five years in, in RC4 and in, in Design Computation Lab, uh, where we play out this notion of, of, the, of the discrete, uh, materializing uh, these uh, basic building elements uh, with a, different techniques and different geometries. Like, uh, they can uh, go from, from a single line uh, to a block that connects to others. Um, so this is uh, um, uh, a part of this research focusing on these uh, linear um, um, fragments uh, that can be tested in, in, its, uh, in their own uh, uh, 24 possible rotations and then combine into a continuous line. Uh, I, I will explain that further in a second. And uh, we use uh, robots to, to basically automate, automate this process. So by just prototyping a single element and testing it in all possible situations, um, we, we can just combine it continuously um, knowing that the, the actual assembly uh, will work at any moment. Uh, but what is important for us is how to control these uh, material organizations uh, throughout the objects uh, to respond uh, to parameters such as uh, density, structure, and, and so on. So although uh, we test mo most of our, um, uh, of our methods in, in chairs, and you will see chairs throughout the presentation quite a lot, um, this is actually the same principle applied to an architectural scale. And uh, that's something also that I've been uh, testing out in my own practice and also in collaboration with other institutions and in, and in workshops. And this one in Kuwait with a, with a visiting school. Um, yeah, using in this case, for example, uh, this is just a single block that has different porosities. Uh, so depending on, on the way you uh, combine it, so it has four possible rotations and it can create a very, very porous surface or a very solid one. Um, yeah, that was... Uh, quite a large installation in, in Kuwait. Um, and again, and as I was uh, mentioning before, uh, the, what is important in this method is the syntax behind it and, and not the actual form of these blocks. So these blocks, these instantiated um, uh, units uh, can contain lines, they can contain blocks, they can contain blobs, right? Uh, like in this case, in a, in a project that uh, we did with the students, with, uh, with uh, Jill and Vicente in the lab, um, where we obviously don't automate the entire process. Uh, that's not a robot pushing the button. Um, so, but basically, these blocks inter interlock uh, together to create an, an unstable shape, which uh, can be materialized in, in different objects, right? From, from a chair to a table, uh, to uh, something bigger, we will have continued with this, with this research for longer. And uh, sometimes we also incorporate the, the notion of flexibility in these parts, as I was describing before. <clears throat> so how um, connecting these parts in, uh, in different ways is actually producing uh, different articulations. Um, so this is another project we did with the, with the students at the, at the Barlet, where we are testing uh, the different flexibility degrees of these, of these objects. Um, to not only respond to structural conditions, but also uh, to behavior conditions. Yeah, and again, I'll go through that very quickly. So as you can see also, this is something that we, again, test in chairs, uh, but uh, that we 
we really consider as an architectural principle that could incorporate uh, other materials and other systems and uh, could be tested in uh, larger scales. Right? So, yeah, um, coming back to, to what these blocks can, can contain and, um, and also, again, to the notion of flexibility. Um, uh, a large part of my, of my research is how uh, these uh, units could actually remain, remain flexible and can be uh, surfaces or, or lines. Um, so this is, this is a very old project now. Uh, when I was a, a student at the at DRL, uh, when I was still young, um, yeah, so these are identical units uh, that, depending on the way they combine and uh, they lock to the ground, are creating different shapes. But essentially, you can um, rationalize the fabrication method to just one single uh, unit. And what is driving the form is the actual uh, combination of, of these pieces. So differentiation doesn't come from uh, the unit itself, uh, but from the actual combinatorial uh, process between, between these units. So you can, you can go from the same material and the same principles uh, from a, a very, very dense space to a very large uh, shell. Um, and this, uh, uh, this really also takes um, some of my, my Spanish heroes as, uh, as the main um, reference for this, uh, this work, where they are, they are playing out this notion of civiality. So in this case, it's always the same uh, concrete unit, uh, but sometimes by just giving this unit uh, flexibility, it can produce heterogeneity, like uh, in this case of uh, Miguel Fisac. Or uh, Jose Miguel de Prada Pool uh, combining uh, the, the flexibility in the elements uh, to, to really play out different formations out of identical uh, inflatable pieces. Um, so, flexibility is something that is also very present in, a, in linear aggregations. Um, so this is a, this is a, a, a larger uh, body of research that I've been developing also um, across my personal practice, but uh, also uh, throughout the, uh, the work of the lab, uh, on how to uh, combine, uh, how to calculate the combinations between these lines in different dimensions so that they create a continuous, a continuous path. Um, so I, I develop um, a software to, to um, um, basically establish this, establish this workflow. And it, um, so it's, uh, it's basically combining uh, poly modeling tools uh, with, uh, with physics uh, so that you can model, uh, so, so you can play with the topology of the object uh, as uh, well as, uh, as changing uh, the, the flexibility of it or, or really um, yeah, playing out uh, different configurations um, uh, connected to a physics uh, environment. Uh, but at the same time, it's also um, giving you um, the, the structure of this linear aggregation that can create a continuous surface. So I tested this in several uh, installations um, at a small scale, but also at a, at a larger scale. Uh, where I, I uh, connect these identical lines in different ways to achieve uh, local uh, differentiation and, uh, and uh, lo locally v v uh, uh, different uh, stiffness levels. And um, so I always get a, a very, very low budget. Um, so, so I have to use uh, whatever is cheapest in the shop around the corner. Um, so in this case, uh, uh, a big part of the research is based on uh, PVC pipes or uh, carbon fiber rods that I discover are even cheaper. That's what you guys are using for the, for the, uh, the pavilion, actually. And uh, yeah, so I've been testing that in uh, several workshops and, and installations, uh, mainly Madrid. So this is, uh, for example, a, a basic structure that we can output from the, from the software and then just establishing the, these principles for a, for a continuous surface. And that works or that keeps all this structure in tension. So this structure is extremely uh, lightweight and extremely cheap and can be put together uh, in just a, a couple of days. Yeah, so again, uh, different scales. Um, in this case, it's uh, investigating further the, the notion of the, of the line. So these are uh, purely uh, linear elements <coughs> uh, with uh, two different scales. And 
I'm going to go a little bit faster. And uh, yeah, so you can basically put, the, put them together in uh, different aggregations. Uh, so there's a simulation process running in the background before. That's the Spanish siesta. Very long. Yeah, there you go. Um, so there is an, an optimization process in the background driving uh, the, um, the position of these pieces and how they should connect uh, to create uh, a stable structure. Yeah, that's the resultant structure. Um, that's, uh, so another material that I've been, I've been playing with uh, quite a lot is bamboo. So bamboo is a, is a, very, in, a very interesting uh, material. It's, um, it's a natural bending active material. So if you bend it, it can uh, remember the shape and it can come back, right? So you can also use it to keep the tension within the material, or um, you can burn it and then it would stay in that position. Uh, so this is a, a sketch on how these uh, pieces could be uh, put together and essentially conserve this uh, uh, flexibility. Yeah? So um, you are not, um, again, just locked to this... Uh, uh, yeah, bo voxelized vox, like boxes together uh, aesthetics, but you can actually recover the notion of continuity uh, from uh, a discrete perspective, just uh, thanks to uh, the flexibility embedded in the, in the element. Um, so in a way, um, and this is something that probably Jill saw at the beginning, uh, so that's uh, Jill's approach to uh, Greg Lean's uh, continuous curve, where, uh, where you are um, using uh, serialized elements to replicate or to approximate that curve. Um, so uh, with, a, with a flexible element, uh, basically, you can conserve that kind of syntax, uh, but formally, it's exactly identical to Greg Lean curve, um, which probably means that we've been wasting our time for 10 years, or maybe this is actually physically, even if physically uh, is the same, conceptually, uh, is, is a, a completely new process. Um, so again, uh, I tested that in uh, several installations. Uh, this is in Taiwan. I'm going to skip through them very quickly. I am also introducing uh, robotic uh, fabrication methods, um, where um, this is actually a very interesting process. So you don't, you don't need to manipulate the entire form, like if you would have to do with 3D printing or CNC, but just by manipulating two vectors, uh, you can simulate what will be the resultant uh, curve. And that's something I tested uh, again in a second iteration of, uh, of this research, again in Taiwan. And then we brought these pieces uh, back to Europe, to, to The Hague, and recombined them in a, in a, different, in a different structure. So these are new clusters uh, that are coming from um, the, the pieces used in a different configurations, uh, configuration in Taiwan. In this case, it was uh, for an art gallery, so it's like a, a wall piece. And a, a very similar concept, uh, but again, uh, incorporating the, the surface within, within this uh, discrete unit, uh, was the one developed for the, the same competition that uh, uh, Jose was showing before, that uh, Sue won. So congratulations. Um, I'm very happy for you. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, this is a very, it's a very straightforward uh, process uh, where you can use a full format sheet and uh, just, just laser cut it and put together with just one human. Yeah, so this is uh, very uh, low tech in around uh, half an hour. So it's half an hour, one, one human, one sheet, one piece. Uh, of course, you need quite a few of these uh, to make the, the entire structure. But you can also just assemble uh, flats, um, so, so you have a, a very clear idea of the syntax and the uh, com uh, combinatorial process of, of these pieces. And then you can pull together to keep this tension uh, for creating a, a larger cell. So that was uh, uh, the first scenario that I uh, imagined for, for this project, but this could be recombined into uh, many different uh, kind of architectures of uh, also many different scales. The dog is very happy there in the corner. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's another. So this research is also evolving in, in different ways, playing out this notion of flexibility. Uh, so in this case, it's combining uh, these uh, flexible lines. And instead of uh, having these uh, continuous surfaces, uh, I'm using um, uh, inflatable 
uh, pieces that work within the line to keep inverted tension in between those two elements, right? So it's a, it's a very similar notion to um, the uh, tensority uh, concept, uh, where you have a, a linear element, in this case our cables, that are constraining um, an inflated or a pneumatic uh, object that is pushing these elements out. And the combination between these two forces uh, results in, a, in an incredibly uh, stiff uh, structure. So this is a real picture, so you can, you can see. Anyway, that's, a, that's an ongoing uh, project. Uh, but um, so with a, with a very similar syntax, and, and somehow this is actually sharing some of the computational methods that I've been explaining until now, uh, but with a completely different fabrication uh, method, um, I would uh, introduce uh, the third hat that I'm, I'm wearing today, that is again actually um, a combination uh, in between um, two of these elements, uh, which is the, the work that we do in the lab and uh, the manufacturing uh, design company, uh, Nagami, which was actually specifically created for, for this project and now uh, moved on to do, to do other projects. Um, so we got, a, we got a commission by the, the Centre Pompidou uh, to create a new piece that would combine all this uh, discrete aggregation uh, research together in the shape of a, of a 3D printed chair. Um, so we develop a, a software and, um, and, a, and a prototype, yeah? So the project is, let's say, both. I don't know if I can put sound here or not. There's no sound, no? Well, it's okay. There's no sound? No one from the organization here? No. There should be sound. Let me check one second. Well, my laptop is okay, you know. Yeah. Can you hear? <laughs> okay. Cool. Anyway, um, it's just for another video, not for this one. But uh, I, I would like to use the speakers, but anyway, it's fine. Um, so yeah. So. Um, uh, here you can see the, in the software we're introducing, in this case, a panton chair, but we can, uh, we can use it with any shape. Yeah? Um, so we, we normally test things with, uh, with panton chairs. And you can generate a huge multiplicity of options <clears throat> depending on the structural conditions. So you see, like in the top right corner, uh, that's the mass distribution of the object. And it depends on how you situate the weights uh, to calculate um, the, um, the stress flow within the object and drive the, the orientation of these pieces. So essentially you have two different pieces only, uh, one flat and one three-dimensional, and uh, the code is using one or another um, to connect it to a density requirement. So when the object needs to be very dense, then you use the flat lines, and when it, in, uh, when it can be porous, and then it uses the three-dimensional lines. Yeah. So you see there. Whoop. Yeah. Okay. No sound. Uh, of course, you can sit in the in the chair. I always get that question. So, and that's my dog. He's so cute. Um. Anyway, some stills of the chair. Uh, it was exhibited in the Centre Pompidou and. Um, I, I've repeated these jokes too often, but uh, so this, I promise this is the very last one. Um, so it, it was very well received by the media, both the technology and design media, um, with uh, amazing uh, critics. Um, like, for example, in this case, we had, like, in one day, 2.2 million views and 800 negative comments. Yeah? No one has talked so badly about a chair ever. Um, so we highlighted some of the some of these comments, very enlightened uh, comments. Yeah, um, I mean, new avenues for explorations, like we can develop the voxel floor, the voxel beanbag, uh, that has lots of commercial possibilities. Uh, I mean, performance, creativia, that's, that's kind of true, but just don't drink beer on my chair, man, like, anyway. Yeah, very explicit. <laughs> yeah, so, so we decided to uh, work on a further implementation and a <clears throat> with a second version of, of, this, of this software to address some of these comments, uh, or maybe not. 
uh, and we tested it in the in the shape of a of a chess log. Yeah. Uh, so in this case, this uh, this software is uh, uh, developed also in collaboration with uh, with Vicente Soler, who introduced the the printability aspect in the software itself. Uh, so while you are designing, you can test if those lines are printable or not. And you also have surface wrapping, so you don't need to necessarily sit on voxels, uh, which is obviously very uncomfortable. Um, so, <laughs> right, like boxes are not always great. Yeah? Um, so anyway, uh, that's, uh, we called it the, the Ogonori, Ogonori chair, uh, which in Europe uh, is the blue spaghetti chair. Anyway, um, so as, uh, as I was mentioning before, um, to, to uh, make this project viable, we had to create our own company um, back, in, back in Spain, um, in my hometown, yeah, Avila. And uh, so, so the company then had a, a longer term uh, purpose of um, introducing a, an, a new, new fabrication method for large scale for uh, design pieces that would challenge this concept, right? So most, um, most uh, companies or uh, well, most, most people investigating on 3D printing, they're essentially scaling up the MakerBot principle, right? And that was the very first idea uh, coined by um, uh, Cosnevics in, in USC. Um, at the same time, so we've been doing this for a while, because maybe because we didn't have larger facilities or larger budgets, uh, but we've always been testing our principles in chairs uh, as uh, all of the important architects uh, have done. So now we're just missing the building part, but we can be um, an architect uh, remember in a history book, which is fantastic because we've done a chair. If you haven't done a chair, you will never be in a history book. Sorry, guys. Um, so I normally leave Rolf, Ross here to talk about this. So we started doing also collaborations with uh, other designers and architects uh, to challenge our technology basically to, to bypass or to go beyond the limitations of a, of a, a normal FDM process of a layer by layer printing, but introducing something else that we couldn't achieve with, a, let's say, a larger version of a, of a MakerBot. Can you hear this? Can you hear this there, Michael? Oh, one minute. Wow, okay. Shit, sorry. Uh, really? No, no, I have five minutes. No, no, I have five minutes. Yes. Okay, anyway, then uh, I will bypass Ross. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, you are missing out, but anyway. That, you can check it online. Yeah? But uh, so basically, he's explaining. Uh, why this process can allow you to create things that you couldn't create before, right? Um, so these are some of the, the features that we're trying to explore in the company, like, for example, introducing uh, color gradients, uh, mixing with other materials, uh, also developing very, like, optimal uh, processes for, for uh, real production of, uh, of furniture. So we obviously sell these chairs as well. And uh, to do so, uh, you need to really reinvent this process so that it's cost, cost effective. Uh, this is a collaboration with uh, Daniel Woodrick. This one with Saha Hadid. All this, uh, all this is online, so you can just, you can just check it out. And um, so, so basically, we introduce new processes in, in 3D printing uh, using industrial robots as a tool uh, that allows us to, to create forms that we couldn't create with a conventional FDM process, right? So in this case, for instance, this is a, a five in the morning video, very dangerous, never do that. Um, so we have to, to create these surfaces, we actually have to move perpendicular uh, to the molds, and we are also extruding, uh, well, okay, let's not do that. Uh, we're also extruding a differentiated thickness. Um, this is uh, Patrick talking, he also talks very well here. Um, yeah, anyway, so this is one of the Saha Hadid chairs, which is also uh, testing, like, if you can print over something that is already printed, um, which is quite interesting uh, and quite challenging because of the, 
the deformations of the of the of the material. But as you can see, like uh, achieving a shape like this um, is very difficult without uh, like horizontal lines in a conventional FDM process. So, so we print uh, a variable thickness that goes from half a millimeter to nine millimeters in the same object, and that's the reason why uh, we managed to uh, materialize shapes that, that we couldn't we couldn't create before. Um, so yeah, again, color gradients. This is uh, another one of the Saha chairs. If anyone is very interested in buying one of these, just uh, come talk to me afterwards. This is a little bit of my promo moment. Um, yeah, so these are some of the, the objects that we currently have. Uh, we've been exhibiting uh, very recently also in, in uh, Saha Hadid Gallery and in Dubai, but also testing uh, the furniture for a wider mass. Yeah? So participating in events like this one with, uh, with Audi, uh, where people were literally just testing the chairs, um, they make they made very good associations with the with the car as well. Uh, for some reason, we got approached by um, various um, uh, car companies. Um, like this one is with BMW. Yeah, I know, it's uh, very commercial, but it's, it's cool, right? Yeah, sorry, I had to show it. Uh, okay, just uh, wrapping this up. Uh, we're also collaborating, and this is an exhibition coming uh, in a few months. Uh, although, so this is in Mars, and it's a real picture. Um, no one is going to go there to check if it's real or not, so you need to believe it's real. Um, so it turns out that uh, it's very efficient to 3D print uh, furniture in Mars, so then you don't need to carry the furniture. So in the background, you are uh, uh, printing some of the chairs. And uh, this is a collaboration with DNA, and um, which uh, you've, you've seen kind of everywhere here. Yeah, and it's, um, so it's a modular system um, uh, based on, uh, on four different uh, robotically 3D printed uh, modules that can be combined uh, in different aggregations, and uh, some of them like the one I'm displaying uh, now here in the exhibition is more sculptural, but the, the idea is that this, this could also be assembled into a selving system, into a, a, a bench, a table, and so on. Uh, so depending on the use that you want to give to these, uh, these elements, you can tweak or you can use this software to satisfy those needs. So it's a, it's a, a product uh, under, under development uh, right now um, that will, will come out as, a, as an actual useful piece of furniture uh, in uh, hopefully next, next year. So uh, those are some pictures of the, the first assembly uh, in, in, in v and in London. Um, that was also very, very easily put together. And uh, yeah, this is actually uh, probably the best picture when it all finished. <laughs> That was great. And uh, so it was uh, reassembled uh, yesterday. Uh, thank you, everyone, who helped me uh, pulling this off in just two hours. That's impressive. So it's a very efficient system. You just need a lot of friends, and then you can assemble it, put it together in two hours. Yeah? So this is fantastic. Um, yeah, also, Eileen was a fantastic model for this picture. I just need to mention it again. Yeah, and uh, so it's, it's right there. So just go check it out uh, in the exhibition space. And uh, that's it. So, um, yeah, some links if you want to watch these videos with, uh, with real sound. And, and also, I'm running a workshop with the Starsky uh, starting tomorrow, uh, hopefully not too early. And so that's going to last for the entire weekend, and we're going to show how to uh, 3D print, uh, how to design for 3D printing, and also test some of these prototypes with a universal robot and a, an extruder that we brought. Um, so yeah, please just come along if you if you feel curious about this. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much.